Now we're going to proceed to the last talk before our discussion panel, which is with Emma Acerbo. Uh, Emma is a postdoc at Emory University. She recently completed her PhD in neuroscience, and she's engaged in pioneering research. Her primary focus involves a cutting-edge, non-invasive method known as temporal interference for neurostimulation in epilepsy. This innovative technique holds the potential to revolutionize deep brain stimulation. Dr. Acerbo's research transitioning from mouse models to human cadavers aims to apply this advanced approach to epilepsy patients using SEEG electrodes. Her discoveries offer promising prospects for advancements in treating mental and neurological disorders. Your participation in our conference is greatly appreciated and we eagerly anticipate your insightful contributions. Welcome, Emma. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah, okay, perfect. So I'm gonna share my slides and thank you for the presentation. For the introduction, let me say. Um, okay, so how do I... Okay, can you see the screen, right? Why, why? Okay, he's going alone. Okay, so we are good. Um, so yeah, as I said, I'm gonna present a non-invasive brain stimulation called temporal interference. I'm gonna refer it as TI in the next slide. It's a new stimulation paradigm for neurological disorders in general. But I, I hope it's not gonna be doing that all the time. So what is electrical stimulation? Electrical stimulation involves the use of controlled electrical impulses to activate the function of cells or uh, tissue within the body. So it has a wide range of applications from medical treatment or basic scientific, uh, scientific research. So the few parameters that I'm gonna talk about and I want to uh, put the thing clear now, it's, um, so here I'm, gonna sh I'm showing you a brain with an electrode into the brain, a depth electrode, and you can stimulate tissue neurons um, with different parameters. So uh, you have frequency, uh, uh, the frequency in Hertz that you can change, um, the current, so the amplitude of uh, the stimulation. I'm, I'm not sure that you see my um, mouse. Can you make it? Um, actually, we see it, but it's not moving. Ah. Yeah, no, now it's good. Yeah, no. oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> so um, yeah, one parameter that is important is the amplitude of the current. The frequency here, I'm describing a basic sine wave, and you can use different types of waveform, sine wave here, or square waves, for example. So you can stimulate the brain with many, many parameters, and it's doing the same thing every time. So uh, maybe I will have to stop and reshare it again, but how did it begin? So the ancient Greek used electric fish, now that torpedo, you have a picture here, for pain relief, by applying electric shock to the affected area. So in A, you have uh, an application for arthritis, and uh, in B, for syphilis. So you put the fish on the head. Uh, but it's only in the 19th century that Dr. Robert Bartolo conducted pioneer experiments where he stimulated the exposed brain, so he removed the skull and was, he was stimulating directly the brain of a patient and observed his reaction. So when he was stimulating the motor area, uh, he was seeing and moving. Um, and it, this marked the first recorded human brain stimulation. And it's doing the same thing. So I'm going to stop the sharing. And I'm going to try to share it again for some reason. Um, I'm sorry for that. I don't know what is, what's happening. OK. But you know, two here. I'm sorry, I think it's going to do that all the time for some reason. Um, if you want, I can share it for you. Yeah, maybe it will be easier because I don't know what. Okay, just a second. Uh -huh. I'm sorry for that. Thing. Okay, yeah. So you can 
can yeah and so the next slide is um okay so you have Yeah, so you have different ways to stimulate the brain. So I showed you on the first slide a GBS for deep brain stimulation where you implant the electrode inside the brain. Uh, so that's A. You have also transcranial magnetic stimulation. I put it here, but I'm not going to talk about it later. It's stimulation with magnetic fields. And then you have a group of um, electrical stimulation for transcranial electrical stimulation, TES, which group two main. Uh, technique, TGCS for transcranial direct current stimulation and transcranial alternative current stimulation. So on the first case, you have an applied voltage constant. And for the other one, you have uh, this alternation of positive and negative. And so you have, uh, you can play with the frequency of the stimulation. Both of them is just electrode placed on the skin. You can move on to the next slide. Okay, so uh, as I said, I grouped it in two uh, different, but there are many ways to group this uh, technique differently. So here, GBS, GCS, and TACS are uh, using electrical current to stimulate the brain, whereas oh, TMS is on the magnetic field. For the next slide, you will see that I will, yeah. Uh, TMS, TGCS, and TACS are non-invasive approach. And DBS is the only way to target deep brain structure, but you have to implant your electrode directly into the structure that you want. So you can move on, yeah. So non-invasive brain stimulation technique have become prevalent in modern medicine because it's uh, you, can, you, you can apply it to a various range of patients and also every subject. But each of these methods offer a unique benefit and application from enhancing cognitive function or treating, treating neurological disorders. On the next slide, you will have the example of Parkinson's disease, which have been the main, um, the first, I would say, neurological disorder that we could effectively treat with DBS. So deep brain stimulation into the basal ganglia has proven to be effective for treatment for Parkinson's disease. So it involves the implantation of electrodes in specific brain region. You can uh, see here it's on the uh, subthalamic nucleus, uh, but you can also implant it in the thalamus. And so you deliver electrical impulsive to uh, suppress the motor symptom. And a DBS has been shown to effectively uh, and significantly reduce tremor and rigidity, improving the life quality of life for many patients. You have the next slide, but I'm not sure that you have the video, if it's working. No, it doesn't work. No, <laughs> I'm going to share my, my screen to show you the video because I think okay. it's a nice thing to show. Um, maybe, um, maybe, no, but you go directly to the... So on the left, you have the same patient that has uh, his GBS turned off. And on the right, the same patient a uh, few minutes after when the GBS has been turning on. So you can see that on the left, he has this movement and this rigidity, and it cannot make precise movement. So you have for the end, and it's also working uh, for the whole body, so also the legs. Uh, you can see that he stopped the tremor. And also for the walk, which I've been, which is very interesting. So on the left, he barely can stand by himself. Uh, on the on the right, he can make his turn and walk. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do it like that. So what about uh, GBS for Alzheimer's and epilepsy? I grouped these two. I'm going to talk about uh, Alzheimer right after. But uh, Alzheimer and epilepsy present the unique challenges in brain stimulation due to their complex nature. 
we don't know the specific region that cause Alzheimer or epilepsy would have been too easy. And we are we will not be there today to discuss about that. Um, so researchers are actively searching for precise stimulation target and methodology. So stimulation parameters for these two conditions. On the top right, I put um, a picture from a review that um, sum up the different uh, target for GBS stimulation in animals and humans. So you can see here for the phonics, ventral capsule striatum, nucleus basis minor, mammal uh, thalamic tract, mammillaris bodies, hippocampus, entorinal cortex. And uh, for uh, epilepsy, it's also the same. We, we have different targets, the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, central region, nucleus of the thalamus, cerebellum, hippocampus, subthalamic nucleus. Many, many uh, targets. Maybe we are not even eating the right one, who knows? Uh, but we have also uh, to play with different type of parameters, frequency, amplitude, etc. So brain stimulation are all the promise for managing this symptom because this uh, different study shows that it has been an improvement, but not it's not a cure. And it's slowing the, propagate, the progression of Alzheimer's disease and reducing the seizure frequency in epilepsy in some patients. So not all the patients are the same. What about uh, Alzheimer's disease uh, stimulation? So, um, it's a, just to sum up, so you have uh, all your stimulation targets, hippocampus, INT, anterior nucleus of thalamus, mammal uh, tract, mammal bodies, phonics, and their possible uh, pathway, protein change, and also their potential protective mechanism, because we don't know yet how is it working. Um, so you have this uh, investigation of these different targets. It has been shown by this study that you can have electrical stimulation can enhance cognitive function and memory, but still, there are st the researchers are continuing to explore the potential therapeutic of stimulation for uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we don't know yet. We have to make uh, new um, new uh, strategies and uh, see more and more patients. But the issues right now with the current approaches is that the brain um, stimulation offers many potential, but first of all, you cannot implant a patient when you are not sure about the result that it will have. Uh, so you have ethical issues related to invasive procedure and the impact on individual autonomy because uh, it's a difficult procedure when you have to implant the brain and you have also a battery in your chest. But what about the non-invasive procedure? But the non-invasive approaches cannot reach uh, deep uh, structure of the brain. So I showed you here TACS simulations of the motor cortex. So TACS is the one with the sine wave uh, mainly. And you can see that the electric uh, field are uh, absorbed main, mainly by the skin and by the skull. And so there is a lot less, less stimulation that can reach even the cortex of the brain. So I'm not, it's not even possible to target deep brain region. So I'm going research right now is vital to address this concern and refine current approaches to ensuring the best possible outcome for the patient. And here it's fixed um, for some reason. So here uh, you have the temporal interference as a possible solution. So everything started in 2017 by the publication of uh, Grossman called Non-Invasive Deep Brain Stimulation via Temporally and Temporally Interfering Electric Field. And so they um, stated that they could reach a deep uh, target in the brain by applying by using two different pairs of stimulators. So you have one pair here and one pair here. These two pairs will we'll stimulate the brain at very high frequency, so above one kilohertz, which is not usually what we are using. We are using, in GBS, frequency below uh, 200 hertz. And these two electric signals, we have a particularity. One of them, we have a shift uh, in hertz, 
different from the first one, which will be your stimulating signal. So they show here that um, they could stimulate the hippocampus of mice with this technique. Uh, and here you have a CFOS staining, which is a CFOS for neuronal activation. And they show that they could focally stimulate the dantegevus of the hippocampus on a, a, a mouse brain section. And so how is it working? So the two very high frequencies we meet at depth at your target, and we create, an, they will add and create this constructive interference pattern which creates an amplitude modulation, which will become your stimulating signal. And the frequency of your stimulating signal will be at that time, so at the shift in between the two frequencies. If you want to have uh, an idea of, um, to be more, uh, to have more sense of what is going on, you can see that, for example, you use 1,300 and 1,430 hertz. So you will have a shift of delta F at 130 hertz. And so when the, the two electric uh, fields will be in phase, you will have an addition. And so you will have a stimulation. And when they will be out of phase, you will, you will have no stimulation. And this pattern uh, appears at 130 hertz. So if you look at the brain, here that you are close to the 1,300 uh, hertz, you have no response because it's stated that neurons do not respond at higher frequencies than uh, one kilohertz. So if you are above one kilohertz, your neuron should not be responding. And so it's the same here with 1,430 hertz. And um, at the middle, you will have this nice amplitude modulation here, whereas here, or over there, you have less and less amplitude modulation, so you will have less and less stimulation. So you, you can ask me, how do you know it's gonna stimulate anything at the frequency uh, of that type? So I have another video, actually, will be the last one. Um, so here, it's a study done by Bajanovsky and collaborators on a peripheral uh, sciatic nerve, so peripheral nerve, just to show you um, why is it working at that time? What is it doing at that time? So they apply it at 350 uh, microamps, the stimulation. And on the left, you have uh, the first electric field at 3000. And the other one will change from 3000 to uh, 3,000 So now uh, they change to the shift at one hertz and you can see the pull of the mouse that is moving at one bit per second. And then it changed to two. And so the mouse is increasing the rate of its pull. And then you go up to five. So um, when the paper of Neil Grossman came out, we were working on epilepsy in Marseille, in France, uh, and we were uh, stimulating mice with normal people are stimulating electrodes, and we were focusing on uh, trying to evoke seizure in mice with this electrode, it's called a kindling protocol, uh, widely used as a, um, a model for epilepsy. And so we were looking at how much current do we need to inject to the mouse into the hippocampus to get a seizure. And we were like, maybe we should try with TI. Uh, maybe well, we have already all the data to compare the stimulation with. And so this is what we did. 
Neil Grossman and collaborators were applying the TI with two uh, screws placed on the skull and the two other pair were placed on the chest of the mouse. But for us, since we were working on epilepsy and the mouse would have seizures, it would be difficult for him to, for the mouse to keep, to keep the electrode on the chest. So we moved the second pair that was originally here on the chest, but we placed it on the skull. And with simulation, we showed that it was even more focal. So we wanted to stimulate the C3 of the mouse. This is what we did with the stimulating electrode. <clears throat> and so we were stimulating uh, with TI at 1,200 and 1,250 hertz to get an overlap uh, amplitude modulation at 50 hertz. So stimulation at 50 hertz, same as the stimulating electrode. We tried two different configurations, one which was parallel to the, to the hippocampus and one that was perpendicular to the hippocampus. What we, what we had was very interesting because uh, here on, in the red, uh, it was, it's our, um, you have the current on the x-axis and the stage of epileptic seizure that the mouse will reach. And you see that at 600 micro -M, you have most of the mouse that were having seizures. And with TI, so this was in basic with the electrode and with TI, you can do the same, the same behavioral output with slightly more uh, need of uh, current, but it was not statistically significant. So we were very happy because we could create a new non-invasive way to, uh, to perform uh, kindling. And I was very interested in maybe, uh, so we published this paper and we needed to move on to treat uh, this neurological disease because I was working in, in an epilepsy lab. So what I did is that I took 30 mice and divided them in three groups. First group will have a TI at 130 hertz because 130 hertz is uh, known to decrease the uh, number of enterectal epileptic form discharges, so spiking activity uh, in both mice and humans in the hippocampus. And so I was using 1,300 and 1,430 hertz to get this 130 hertz envelope. To compare, I use the TACS um, method, meaning that I was using the pair, the closest pair to the hippocampus for the mouse, because the hippocampus is here, and I was applying one of the hertz. And then we had a, a sham, which um, had no treatment. And so all the mice were uh, having epileptic seizures, and I was trying to see the impact of this technique on mice. And so <clears throat> it will be the last uh, slide about mice, but which is interesting here. So I was recording this enterectal epileptic form discharges, this IED spiking activity in the mouse. And I was looking at the different features of the spiking activity. So the rate, so the number of them per minute, the amplitude, the duration, and the area of the wave of the spike. So first of all, for the rate, uh, in uh, yellow, you have the baseline, in blue, you have sham, and then you have TI and TACS, which I call it uh, HFS uh, for high frequency stimulation. And you can see that my protocol for, stimulate, for uh, inducing epileptic seizure worked because we had an increase of, um, of spiking activity, but when you apply the TI at 130 hertz, you can see that you have a decrease in the number of spiking. And then you can tell me, yes, but we see also not difference with the HFS. <clears throat> and that's maybe because, I mean, 130 hertz is working and the mice, they have uh, their hippocampus on right below the cortex. So it was not surprising that it worked. But with TI, it's the only paradigm of stimulation that can that can decrease back to baseline, so back to the same level as yellow, uh, the number of spiking. And when you look at the different features, 
it's only uh, chi that can decrease uh, the area, the duration, and the amplitude of the interactive ability for discharges. And so basically, what we saw it was the same effect of TI as an impocalpal GBS running at 130 hertz in mice. So now we wanted to move on to uh, humans. And so we took human cadavers, and everything started with Neil Grossman. He contacted us to uh, perform this experiment in human cadavers for a paper that I'm going to show you right after. But um, I think it's, I like the way it's presented here, so I'm going to show you right here. So for these uh, human cadavers, uh, we implanted them with depth electrode. It's called SEG, step for stereo electroencephalography uh, uh, electrode. But it just, we, are, we were just recording with this electrode. And so we were implanting all of this electrode into the brain to try it to record the artifacts of the stimulation. We were not looking for any activity, of course. The aim here was just to record the artifact and see where we were at the in the brain for the stimulation. So you have um, the implantation here, and then on the mesh, you can see that I plotted the amplitude of the envelope, so the amplitude of the amplitude modulation, so the amplitude of your stimulation, if you prefer. And you can see that we can uh, be slightly um, focal when you have a stimulation only in the place where you have, uh, you're supposed to have the hippocampus and not in the control areas. The coordinate for the brain stimulation, so we were placing uh, a, a repurposed electrocardiogram uh, electrode placed on the skin to uh, send the stimulation and all the coordinates were given so the aim was to stimulate the, the hippocampus. If we look at only electrode F, for example, so the one that was supposed to be in the hippocampus, um, you can see that at depth, you have a big amplitude of your stimulation. So you can see that you have a nice amplitude modulation that go back to zero. And when you go back to the cortex, you have less and less amplitude modulation. So less and less stimulation. You can create TI with sine wave, but you can also create TI with square waves and other type of waveform. But it's the same. You have this uh, big amplitude modulation at depth. And when you go back and back to, uh, to the cortex, you have less and less stimulation. So you can create a focus of stimulation at depth without stimulating the surrounding tissue. And when you look at the TACS, the one of the are just placed right uh, in between the, the electrodes, so you have your stimulation electrode here, and your recording electrode there. And you can see that the maximum of amplitude of stimulation was in the cortex. And when you go deeper and deeper, you have less and less stimulation. A few words about uh, an epileptic patient because we had the chance to apply it on two epileptic patients uh, when I was in Marseille, in France. So this patient had the um, uh, same implantation of uh, this electrode, of depth elect electrode, in order to record the uh, brain activity. Yeah. And um, yeah. So it was it was recording for the brain activity, and we had the chance to um, to stimulate uh, the patient. And we were looking at also IEDs, the interactive platform discharges. And you can see that during this twenty minutes of stimulation of TI at one hundred thirty hertz, same as mouse, um, we were decreasing the number of spiking activity. And then before, compared to before, and then after, you have a slightly increase, but it's still less than uh, the uh, stimulation. We were looking also at the area of the wave and duration and the amplitude, and also TI was the only one that could decrease the uh, number and the features of this electric spike. Excuse me. I'm, I'm going to need to short my piece.
Sí, es verdad. A ver. So. Uh, yeah, and the number one point. Uh, sorry. Um, when we are stimulating the hippocampus, the patient, he didn't, we, we explained him uh, all the padding and everything that we were stimulating. But it was, we were not like expecting any, uh, um, any thing from him except his brain activity. But the patient told us, in this world, it's weird. I when you were stimulating, I kind of remember when I was a child. I had these memories going on, and so we were very surprised because we were stimulating the hippocampus, and we had these patient-related memories. And so we were very proud that we could do that, but we didn't um, um, went further. For us, it was only uh, epilepsy. But it's a great link for the new papers that we publish this month. So what about the HE subject and the impact of GI immune? So uh, Ines and me have published uh, this paper, and I am on it, and I'm going to talk to you. I we provided the human cadavers experiment for that um, uh, paper. So it's called non-invasive temporal interference electrical stimulation of the human hippocampus. So here, similar to new experiment combining TI and functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, were conducted to study the change in brain activity and provide evidence for target engagement. So here, which is great compared to what we did in patient, is that you are using, we were using imaging, and imaging will not be affected by the electrical stimulation as recorded in depth electrode, because um, in our depth electrode, we were recording also artifacts of the stimulation that could be, um, um, would lead to some difficulties to analyze uh, the data. But here, since it's a new paradigm, uh, another paradigm of, of looking at the, at the activity of TI, it's better. So the study tested the behavioral impact of TM stimulation in the hippocampus on FE participant. So here it's just um, it's um, a simulation and our human cadaver data. So an added advantage is of our approach by the dynamic control over the stimulation focus. So you have the simulation here. So you have your two pairs of stimulation that was targeting again the hippocampus of the patient. Here you have the design of uh, the placement of the electrode. And here they um, added another another way to improve the TI, meaning that they were using different current ratio. So if I apply one milliamp and one milliamp, the stimulation focus will appear at the middle of the two um, stimulating electrodes. But you can steer the current, meaning that you can apply three milliamp and one milliamp. And so the on the side of three milliamp, it will push the focus of stimulation, and so it would be more close to the one uh, pair. And that's very uh, interesting because you can now have a kind of freedom of where to place your stimulation focus if you cannot move your electrode, even though it's non-invasive, it's just a patch you can place on the skin. But still, when you have a setup, you maybe don't want to uh, to replace your electrode every time. Uh, so. That we did that for them. Um, we uh, did the, the cadavers uh, recording. And so the hippocampus was divided, and also the cortex, just to show you, uh, it was divided into three parts. Same as before, you have uh, less amplitude modulation in the cortex, and you have a maximum of stimulation in the hippocampus. And when you look at the hippocampus with the uh, steering effects, so TI11 or TI13, you can see that TI11, you are right on, in the hippocampus, you don't have any um, change, but when you do 1-3, you steer the focus of simulation into the anterior part of your hippocampus. So, um, so 
what we saw is that you have an air activation of the hippocampus, showcasing the specific and efficacy of stimulation. And I'm going to show you here. And moreover, the capability to shift the stimulation and focus to the entire part, and you can see it on the, I'm trying to move a bit on the, the um, here you, you see that the envelope compared to uh, TI11 and TI13, you can see it to, to the entire part of the hippocampus. No? Right. So they did 20 patients, so nine, uh, nine male and 11 female. They underwent this TI stimulation during functional MRI with blood, bold, so the blood oxygenation level dependent imaging. While participating, so the participants were doing a hippocampal dependent face name pair associated task. So they had two uh, sessions one uh, session of encoding. So you have the name and the face, and the participant will learn. And you have the uh, TI stimulation either during the encode, encode part for the first part of the study, but I'm going to talk to you more about the results for the second part of the study. So you have this phase and name, and then you have a recall part where you have the choice in between uh, a different name for the same phase. And so um, on the next slide, I'm going to show you when they stimulating during the encode part and during the recall. Okay, but without any stimulation, you have a different uh, brain activation um, of the hippocampus. And they show that during the encore part, the hippocampus was more activated than the recall part. So they started to try stimulation only during the encore part, stimulation that will be at five hertz corresponding to the theta, theta band. But uh, better results were done when uh, TI stimulation was applied during the encode and the recall session. So, what they see here in the sham is that also the entire part of the hippocampus was more activating. So for the simulation, tired out for each patient. So here it's a simulation, just to show again that uh, um, when you do one TI11, you have more activation on all the hippocampus. And when you do TI13, you have a more activation of um, the entire part. So they demonstrated the precise targeting of the entire segment of the hippocampus by adjusting the current. This focus targeting was consistently achieved across all the patients. So they were doing a, a simulation with a ZMRI of each patient. And by employing the TI13 stimulation protocol, we observe a notably stronger modulation of uh, the hippocampal neuronal signal. But most importantly, our findings reveal a significant effect of TI stimulation on uh, participant performance, meaning that during stimulation, they had a better rate of right answer and correct recall during the stimulation compared to sham condition in gray. But there were no significant difference on number of foil or disc vectors. So meaning that they were able to um, improve the memory of the participant. But they also demonstrated the safety and the tolerability of TI stimulation in humans. There's no adverse effect reporting on these 20 patients. Um, on uh, our side with the patients, we uh, do not have any uh, side effect only a tingling sensation on the skin when the stimulation was applied. So it proves the capacity to modulate the hippocampal activity and influence the behavioral performance. Of course, a further study aim to understand the long-term effect of stimulation. Uh, in memory and should investigate whether the extent, uh, more extent TI stimulation or repetition may have um, better and stronger effect on, on memory on this patient, on this participant, because they are What are the current um, challenges for CHED right now? It's the, um, principally it's a modelization for each patient. It's very time consuming, and we hope that we can 
uh, at some point have new tools to have simulation that could do I could provide a simulation without the need of uh, a lot of computational uh, time with each patient MRI, of course. Uh, also, we would like to have uh, appropriate device to perform stimulation, which will be FDA approved, meaning that right now, all the device that we are using to do GBS, normal GBS stimulation, are not I mean, they don't have the capacity to go at higher frequency. And uh, especially that now, we are using not a lot of 1,000 or 2,000, but if you go higher and higher on your uh, stimulation um, frequencies, you have a less and less sensation on the skin because your impedance drops with the higher uh, frequencies of stimulation. But the device will, are not equipped for that and especially also uh, our recording system is an issue because I told you um, we had electrical artifact and the electrical artifact is in fact um, an issue because you saturate your amplifier because since TI is using high frequencies you can easily in theory easily remove the frequency uh, and the artifact of stimulation by applying a low pass filter but you cannot because you have saturating your player. So it's all technical problems uh, and issues that um, it's difficult to assess right now because equipment is not tailored for that. And also we should have different paradigm to test memory and uh, test different frequency of stimulation to reproduce the effect on this CBS. So it would be great now to take a very nice paper done in Alzheimer's disease and uh, with results and try to reproduce it with TI. So few words of conclusion and discussion. So TI can create a deep stimulation focus without stimulating the surrounding area. We can both evoke epileptic seizures because in my mind, uh, the first step we were evoking seizures, but also applying a treatment at 130 Hz, uh, everything depending on the frequency use of the delta F. The non-invasive stimulation has an effect on epileptic biomarker, but also on cognitive function. Also, depending on the geometry, the position of the electrode, it is possible to adapt TI to humans, and one configuration can be uh, easily um, modified uh, with, the, with the steering, as I explained to you, to reach different targets. So now we have also different uh, path to try to improve TI also. Um, so we, right now we are trying to, um, to control the focality and have a better, uh, smaller focus of stimulation to really map very precise region of the brain. And so to do so, we uh, put on a preprint on bioarchive about controlling the intensity of non-invasive deep brain stimulation using multipolar control interference in a uh, non-human primate, primate and rodents, meaning that we, by increasing the number of uh, stimulating uh, electrodes based on the skin, you can have um, a smaller uh, TI focus. And you can also apply it to uh, other applications on epilepsy, for example, sleep apnea. And I have some colleagues that published um, another paper about uh, TI that can reduce the sleep apnea in patients. Uh, some acknowledgement, I would like to thank my two supervisors at Emory University, so Dr. Robert Gross and Dr. Uh, Train, also my team, Karen Peter-Kunz, Ken Berkun, Henry Mathieu, Eric, and, and everyone. Uh, also our uh, closest collaborators, uh, Dr. Adam Williamson, Florian Missy, and Ibrahim Alinga at FUSNA, which is a, a place in Czech Republic. We have also, uh, I want to thank also Dr. Ines um, and uh, Katevan Alana and Neil Grossman and all the guys that were doing the simulation for Ezra uh, and Anthony. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very sorry for the slide that kept moving all the time. So I will, thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. We really enjoyed the presentation. It was very informative.
Uh, we have got some questions from the audience. The first one is from Catalina. Hello, Emma, your presentation was a pleasure. My question is, what specific neurological and psychiatric disorders might benefit from non-invasive TI stimulation of the hippocampus, and how does this approach address the limitation of traditional DBS? So, um, so regarding the, um, the first part of the question about which psych uh, neurological disorders you can apply, so you can apply it to I'm not saying all, but most of the neurological disorders that can be um, impacted by GBS. So you have right now depression, um, OCD, so oppressive, uh, oppressive, optional, um, ob obsessive compulsive disorder, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so you have this kind of, of treatment. I would like to uh, also think about the pain uh, pain management is uh, very. Stop saying. Uh, pain management is also something very important, and you can also do it uh, within the uh, CNF within the central nervous system. But you can also apply it to uh, spine cord stimulation, which is something that we really want to do because it seems that it's working so well uh, on peripheral nerves. So um, that's where we are going. So the thing is, with TI, you can also probe the efficacy of GBS, meaning that, for example, for, um, let's say, schizophrenia. I'm not sure, I didn't do the literature, but I'm not sure that there is um, uh, evidence for a GBS implantation in this patient. We have so many treatments. Uh, it's not working very well with the drugs. Why don't we try TI? It's non-invasive. If it's working, it may be a good advice, a good, a good way of thinking. Maybe this patient will need a GBS and we get better after. And if it's not working, we'll say, okay, we can move on to another treatment, drug or GACS, TDCS. So I really think that TI right now can be very useful to, to probe the uh, for which patient it would be great to implant or not, because we are not saying that TI is better than GBS, which answers your second question. It's not better, but it's non-invasive. So if it's working, great, we can implant the GBS. If it's not working, we can move on. And maybe it's not a good idea to implant a patient uh, with this GBS. In epilepsy, many patients when uh, you don't know where the focus of, of epilepsy is, when it's difficult to treat a seizure with medication, they don't have a lot of choice. And uh, GBS is one of the answer, but that doesn't work. That it's not a good answer for all the patients. So let's try to pop this with TI. That's that's how I, I see the TI application in, in, in therapeutic for the next year. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Marij. Hi, Ms. Acerbo. Thank you for your presentation. I was wondering if the activity of the anterior hippocampus and at the memory task and the sham condition might have been related to showing faces specifically. The fusiform facial area of the fusiform gyrus is also particularly sensitive to human faces. So I wondered if you will conduct a replication of the study with a stimulus other than faces. So, uh, yeah, so this task was chosen because we knew that it evoked um, um, activity in the anterior part of the hippocampus. And we compare it with sham. So you have, uh, on the last slide, you have the comparison with sham and TI stimulation. And that's where you have an increase. I'm not, I'm not um, um, working on cognitive task, et cetera. But that's what I said. I said it's way, and uh, it would be interesting for the next years of next studies to try other paradigm of, of task where you can maybe see other things and uh, faces. Maybe you can see, I don't know, uh, words and uh, describe. And I know that it tells a lot of projects. I'm sure you know better than me. But yeah, for sure, it's, it's, it's new. 
there's a lot of place for all the of the studies. The only thing is that right now they are kind of limited because it's very very new. And we had uh, in France when I was a PhD student, I tried to do uh, a protocol for um, uh, to be clinically approved, uh, but it was very difficult because it's a new technique and. People, if they don't see that other people are doing it, they are kind of afraid to be the first one. So now that we have published this paper, there are also a few other papers that are uh, peer review paper articles online. So now I think that is going to increase and you're going to have more and more uh, tasks and more and more targets, which is great. Uh, yeah, so no, we didn't try. I hope someone will try, maybe one of you, if you are interested in um, their space. And that's, yeah, very interesting results, I'm sure. Okay, the, que the next question is from Evelyn. Thank you very much, Emma. Your presentation is very interesting. I was wondering, after DBS surgery, what happens when the batteries go low? Is the treatment over before the batteries are done? Do you replace them? Yeah, we replace them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you have, you have the DBS, you have also the vagus nerve stimulation where you wrap. Um, an electrode around your uh, uh, vagus nerve, and also it's a treatment for epilepsy. So the battery is placed on the chest, and I think the battery is uh, stay for like five to ten years. So, and you just like the patient is going to the uh, to the OR and got his battery replaced. So it's a it's a life treatment. Maybe they remove it when they see that it's no longer benefit for the patient and but I never heard about that. So I heard about replacement of, of battery. Yeah. Yeah. But they stay long. See so if I have five minutes to to say uh to say a little bit of the story. Uh yes. when we were doing the cadaver experiments. And uh so in Marseille it was uh like in the eighteenth centuries everything was rusted. It was it was something we were with cadavers, great, 8 a.m. in the morning, awesome. I was placing the electrode uh, that you see, uh, the depth ele electrode to record the artifact. And I was with a, a colleague, a PhD, another PhD student. And then he told me, Emma, can you come, come see? And I was like, yeah, sure. And so our cadavers were like, die, die, they die, they pass away maybe three years, and then they were perfused and stored in this fridge for two or three years. So body was like for like five, six years. Okay. And, and he told me, can you come see? And then I look at the screen for the recording and I saw a heartbeat. And I started to, it was crazy. And you had this heartbeat, heartbeat uh, going on the recordings. And we were like, hello, are you alive? And we completely freak out. And then I saw a bump on his chest and it was a pacemaker that was placed here and no one removed it. And the battery for run for maybe six years after the guy passed away. And he was like, keep breathing, keep breathing. You're alive, you're alive. And so that, that battery can stay for four years. So to answer your question, you have, battery replacement, but you can wait 10 years, I think, safely to before replacing it. So that was the story of the morning. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. So we have a comment from Sika. I hope I'm pronouncing right the names. Uh, said, I appreciate the presentation. It confirms some of my own results. Bravo. Um, Thank you. And also... <laughs> Another question from Catalina. In the context of motor disabilities, how can non-invasive electrical stimulation methods like temporal interference be adapted to enhance the mobility or control of muscles for individuals with paralysis or motor impairments? So that's a very good question. Um, I, so um, how... I don't I don't have the answer on how it can uh, help someone with a that have um, motor impairment like that. I just 
for me right now, the only thing is that we can uh, try to provoke the re um, the rehabilitation so we can stimulate it has been shown that by stimulating the spinal cord you can uh, try to enhance the, the regrowth of neuron in the spinal cord to help this patient to to um, have um, a better rehabilitation uh, for the other patient i don't know but you can do that and um I, yeah i i cannot really answer except that by stimulating the spinal cord, you can just try to make it regrow. And I guess uh, in a non-invasive way, it's better than the invasive. And also you can, with simulation, you can think about an arrangement of electrodes where you can have only four and maybe try to stimulate along the way of your spinal cord and try them to regrow. Where uh, GVS is great, but it's very focal. So maybe you will need a lot of electrodes where in TI, you can have like only two pairs and try to have a great piece of, of your spinal cord. I hope it, that does answer to your question, but yeah, uh, if you can think about something. If you look on, on if you search for a paper that says that, uh, that GBS can improve this patient for motor dysfunction, maybe you can try it with TI. Okay, that was it for the questions. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.